Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Advanced Hebrew. This is week four, the long-awaited week four. Uh, apologies for the long time uh, dealing with technical difficulties on this one. But anyway, uh, the notes for this class, as usual, you can find at theregathering.com slash page slash PFT Hebrew 3. Um, and you will need those notes uh, for certain this week. Um, I'm going to go through the verb conjugation chart that is in those notes and give you an introduction to what a conjugation chart looks like. So I'm going to go through every uh, part of that um, file and show you what it all means because you're going to see a number of these in the uh, continuing classes. So the first thing you'll notice about any verb conjugation chart is there will be this phrase here in the upper left. And this says pa'al. This is the name of the binyan that uh, this conjugation chart represents. There are seven binyanim, okay, seven patterns that verbs can follow. And I will explain those patterns as we come to them. This one is pa'al. Pa'al is also known as kal. Okay, kal means simple. And so this is the most simple straightforward binion. It means it, it is the most basic meaning of the verb. Over here is the name of the Gizra. So this particular Gizra is Gizrat Shlamim. And Shlamim means complete. Um, basically it means the normal Gizra. It's not a Lamed Aleph, not a Lamed He. We talked about two of those in regard to the present tense uh, in a past class. Um, but this just means it, what it, technically what it means is that none of the root letters will drop out of the word in the conjugation of the word. Um, but for our purposes, we can think of it as the default or the normal gizra. Um, and just to give a refresher, every Hebrew verb, or I should say most Hebrew verbs, derive from a three-letter root, which are indicated in these charts by three boxes, number one, two, and three. Okay, now this three-letter root could be any three letters. This is one such root, shin, mem, resh. And the basic meaning of this particular root is to guard or to keep. So in the phrase, keep the commandments, this is usually the verb in question, translated as keep. Okay, but in this case, the shin is the first radical, the mem is the second radical, and the resh is the third radical. So as we conjugate things in these charts, they operate just like the charts for the present tense, although in, the, uh, in this tense that we're looking at, there are more possibilities than just the four that we're limited to with the present tense, or uh, otherwise known as the active participle. This chart is a chart of the perfect tense. Now, I'm using perfect tense because that is the um, technically the name of the tense as applies to biblical Hebrew. Modern Hebrew simply calls it the past tense, and indeed in many respects this tense functions just like the past tense that we are, we are all familiar with. The technicality is that the perfect tense the term perfect refers to an action that has already been completed. Okay, not an action that is perfect in that it is good, but that it, is, it has already been done. Um, and so usually the context of that indicates something that happened in the past. Okay, so I will use the terms interchangeably. In fact, I will probably prefer to use the term past. Um, but anyway, if you hear perfect tense and past tense, you can pretty well correlate those two terms. I am using them both just so you will be familiar with both of them, so in your continuing studies you don't get mixed up on which tense is being referred to. And over here is the uh, Hebrew word avar, which means past tense. And on some conjugation charts, um, on mine I give the English and the Hebrew, on some you will only find Hebrew, so if you see avar on a conjugation chart or in a Hebrew grammar book in general, it's referring most likely to the past tense. Okay, so onto the uh, chart itself. I have it divided 
by person. So 3P here is third person, 2P is second person, 1P is first person. In any conversation or a piece of writing, there are three people that can be addressed or that can perform an action in the case of verb conjugation. The first person is the person doing the writing or the speaking. So anything that I do or we do is uh, done in the first person. Second person is the one being spoken or written to. Okay, so in a commandment, you know, you shall not steal. Steal, um, the verb steal in that verse must be in the second person form because it is referring to the actions of you, of a second person uh, subject. That'll make a little more sense as we move on. The third person is anybody besides the speaker and the spoken to. So if you're speaking about somebody else, then that person is the third person. And also, any noun uh, qualifies as a third, um, we'll use a third person verb to uh, describe its actions. Okay, second person and first person, their actions um, will always be associated with the pronouns I, we, you, etc. The third person could be anything, a horse, a turtle, a duck, uh, a man, uh, the pronouns he, she, they, all of those will take third person verbs. And as we use more examples, you'll see this in action. Okay, so we've got first person, second person, and third person. Below that, it's further subdivided into masculine. Remember, Zachar stands for masculine, so this Zion, again, is a symbol of masculine. And Nikeva, which is feminine. So second person is divided into second person masculine, second person feminine, identically with the third person, masculine and feminine. You'll notice the first person does not have any gender distinction. And that's because you use the same verb in the first person whether um, the one speaking is a man or a woman, or rather the one acting is a man or a woman. Okay, In the first person, you do not need to distinguish between gender. So that completes the columns, first person, second person, masculine, feminine, third person, masculine, feminine, and there's a further subdivision of singular and plural. Okay, so the first person singular is uh, me. Okay, there's one of me. I'm in the first person, and I'm singular, but we, or us, is the plural. It still includes me, it's still in the first person, but there is more than one, so it's plural and so on and so forth, as we learned in the class about pronouns. All right, so why all of this subdivision? Well, because the verb has to match its subject in gender and number. And in the case of these verbs, it also must match in person. So, suppose we wish to speak of a man, but we'll just call him who, which is Hebrew for he. Okay, so who, we want to say he kept. He kept. In order to do that, we match the subject. Okay, first off, it's masculine. He is masculine, and he is third person. It's somebody we're talking about. It's not ourselves, and it's not the one we're talking to, but it's someone we're talking about, he. Okay, so we've got third person, masculine, and he is singular. Not they, but he, so singular. And these charts are designed so that you can line up all of these parameters and get to the conjugation in question. Okay, so to say he kept, again, the root of kept, Shin, Mem, Resh, to keep. So we plug in the letters of the root into their corresponding parts on the chart and add the necessary vowels. And we come up with Shin, Kometz, Mem, Patach, Resh. Pronounced Shamar, Shamar. 
So hu shamar means he kept or he guarded. Okay, and as we go down um, down the list, if we wish to say that she kept, we have to follow the third person feminine singular paradigm. And this one has a different vowel structure and adds a hey at the end. So she kept becomes he. He. Again, mimicking the vowels, adding the hey at the end. He shamra. She kept. Now in the past tense, third person plural, there is again no distinction between masculine and feminine. Okay. So to say they kept, because they is the third person plural pronoun, they kept, Haim would be the masculine and Hain would be the feminine. We can use either one with this, or I should say we can use this conjugation with either one of those pronouns. Okay, so Haim or Hain. Sham Ru. Haim Sham Ru. Okay, that would mean they kept. So again, this conjugation is all about matching the verb to the subject. Okay, it has to match in person, in gender, and in number. So I'll give examples of all of these so we can... Uh, I'm going to have a tendency to include the pronouns that match the person. Okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to tend to include second person and first person pronouns with verbs. This is technically redundant. Okay, technically it is not necessary, although it is sometimes done in the biblical text uh, to add emphasis, but it is not necessary to include a pronoun with the verb that is properly conjugated. If it's a second person verb, it automatically implies that you are doing something. It's not necessary to use the pronoun for you. Okay, but I'm going to do that because it is a memory aid and helps you to associate the form of the pronoun, or I'm sorry, the form of the verb with the pronoun that it matches. All right? So in the second person, masculine singular. We've got a tav at the end with the comets underneath it. So the second person masculine singular pronoun is ata. Okay, ata means you, if you happen to be masculine and singular. So ata shamar ta. That means you kept. Again, it's kept because this is the past tense that we're conjugating. There's a whole other chart like this uh, for the future tense, which is uh, on your notes. It's directly below this one, and we'll go over that more in detail in the next class. But ata shamar ta, you kept. All right, the feminine is spelled the same, but with a vowel change. Comments at the end changes to a schwa. So at shamart. 
You'll notice too when I add the pronouns, the, pro the uh, correct pronouns, that the endings on the verbs tend to match the endings of the pronouns. Ata shamarta, at shamarta. Right, it's got the same same idea uh, in those endings, which also helps to remember uh, all these terms. The second person, masculine plural. So if you, a group of you, and that group happens to be masculine, Okay, that pronoun is atem. And I believe that dogish is actually absent. So atem, shamar tem. Again, you kept, but in this case, you is a group of men. And the feminine, second person, plural. Easy to make this transition. A ten, shamar ten. Again, you kept if you is a group of women. So, ata shamarta, at shamarta. A tem shamar tem, a ten shamar ten. There's quite a bit of parity in the endings, and that uh, does serve as a memory aid as we weave through these uh, conjugation charts. All right, and back uh, just remembering the third person: who shamar, he shamra, and haim shamru, hain shamru. We could also use anything else there. We could say Adam Shamar, Adam kept. We could say Rachel Shamra, Rachel kept. Again, we would have to change to the feminine since Rachel is the name of a woman. And we could say Adam the Rachel, or the Rachel rather. Adam the Rachel, so that's Adam, the Vav prefix in front of Rachel. Adam the Rachel, Shamru. Okay, Adam and Rachel kept. All right, so in the third person, we can use any nouns or we can use the third person pronouns. In the second person, we're always referring to the second person pronouns, although we don't have to specifically use them. And the first person, we're always referring to the first person pronouns. So what would Ani do? Okay, what would I do if I, if I kept? Ani... Shamar T. Okay, has the T ending for the first person singular. Go ahead and rewrite this. So Ani is I. We could also say Anochi, the full form. But Ani is perfectly acceptable. And again, plugging in. First radical, the vowel underneath it. Second radical, the vowel underneath it. Third radical and its vowel. And then our ending. Ani shamarti, I kept. And in the first person plural. We kept would be anachnu for we. Shamar nu. Anach nu. Which I always have difficulty spelling. I know that's close. 
but I do have it spelled correctly in the pronoun chart from um, the class where I went over pronouns. So I did check my dictionary then. All right, anachnu shamarnu, we kept. All right, so there's all these different ways that we can manipulate the root shamar, which actually isn't pronounced shamar, it's just shin maim resh. Um, I will, um, as an aside, mention that for any of you who use a Strong's concordance, when you look up a verb in that concordance, or a word that can be used as a verb, the Strong's will frequently direct you to the root of the word. And when you find the root in a Strong's, that root will be given a pronunciation. They will put vowels underneath the letters and they will give a pronunciation of the word. The pronunciation that they're giving you in the Strong's is the, um, the paradigm that I had first written on this board. So Strong's will give you the Binyan Pa'al, third person, or I'm sorry, Binyan Pa'al, the past tense, third person, masculine, singular pronunciation. Okay, and that is the pronunciation that they associate with the verb in question. Um, so they use the simplest form, third person, masculine, singular. All right, if you look up the same root in a Hebrew dictionary, you will find that it does not have any vowels attached. And that is so because the root itself does not have its own pronunciation. It's just three letters. And the third person masculine singular is just one permutation. Okay, it's just one conjugation of those three letters. So, um, so that is that, and that's how you can kind of understand how a Strong's is set up. I think they put the pronunciation just so that you're not left you know, with, with no idea how to pronounce uh, the word. And since the Strong's is mostly composed of roots, they didn't want to kind of leave people in the dark who don't know Hebrew. So, but just be aware that when you find that root, that is not how the word's going to be pronounced in every uh, occasion of its use in the Bible. In fact, more than half the time, it probably won't be given that pronunciation. Although, there are a lot of uh, masculine singular nouns which do a lot of actions in the biblical text, and so you will actually find that pronunciation. But again, if you change, if you just change that to the future tense, the pronunciation will be entirely different. So it all, all depends on these verb conjugations. Now, Hebrew is not the only language that has verb conjugations, uh, not by any stretch of the imagination. If you've taken Spanish or German or um, numerous other languages, they all have them. English even has them to a degree, but they've been somewhat obscured because English is such a hodgepodge of so many languages and um, has very few consistent uh, rules in regard to uh, manipulation of words. But one, one such manipulation you can find in English is you can take a, take a verb, um, say walk, W-A-L-K, and if you wish to make it past tense, you can add the suffix E-D. Okay, this works with walk, it would work with um, stroke, uh, you know. I'm thinking of a bunch of irregularities. Of course, find is found, it doesn't end in ed, and there's plenty of others. Um, but for a number of verbs in English, adding the suffix ed makes it past tense. That's a form of verb conjugation, just like the suffixes on these um, paradigms here make them particularities of the past tense. So if you find a word that ends in T, you can be pretty sure it's a first person singular past tense verb. Um, like I say, you're going to encounter many charts that look just like this. I encourage you to memorize this chart. This is the simple Binyan, the simple Gizra, and the endings on these verbs closely match the endings on the pronouns that go along with them. So this is a great one to memorize. And um, once you start learning other binyanim and other gizrot, 
and other tenses, all right, it's, it's going to become a, a big jumble real fast. And um, knowing how to navigate this chart is going to be more valuable than memorizing it uh, because you can't possibly, well, it's not that you can't possibly do it, but it's quite, a, it's quite a project to try to memorize every single conjugation. When there are seven binyanim and a number of gizrot in each one, and then you have to remember which, which gizrot are in which binyans, and um, you got to remember past tense, future tense, present tense, participles, infinitives, okay, justives, um, imperatives. There's all kinds of tenses also. There's not just past, present, and future. So... Anyway, memorizing all of those is, um, is a chore, to say the least. But if you understand how to use these charts, you don't, have to have, uh, you don't have to have each pattern memorized. You can simply look it up if you require it, and you'll know how to find what you're looking for. But I do encourage you to memorize this one. Um, it's not that much, and, it, and uh, it does match the pronouns, so it's easier. And it gives you just a baseline to compare all of the other conjugations too. So I do uh, definitely encourage you to memorize this chart. And, um, and of course I used shamar throughout, but you can use any three letter root and you apply the same pattern to it to get your past tense, first person singular, plural, second person, masculine, feminine, singular, and plural, and so on and so forth. All right, so I could have used um, pa'al, which is the word for verb, or to do, um, you know, I can use any any three-letter root can be applied to this pattern. Okay, lamed mem dalit, which means to learn. Okay, he learned would be who. Okay. Third person, masculine, singular. Who, lamad. He learned. All right, and so on for any three-letter root. Of course, barring the ones that belong to particular gives wrote. Uh, so the lamed aleph and lamed he that I spoke of in the present tense, okay, that's a root that ends in an aleph. It would be a lamed aleph. Belong to uh, gizrat lamed aleph. So kuf resh aleph, which means to read or to call, belongs to lamed aleph. That will be the subject of next class, going through uh, the past tense of um, of several gizrot that are still in binyan pa'al. And I believe that concludes our material for this class. So again, memorize this chart, understand how to use it, and we'll see you next time. Shalom.